So, maybe 
right at the outset, let me give a summary of my results. So the answer to the question of how do you get an instability in a Fermi band insulator, which doesn't have a Fermi surface, is that you never go from a Fermi insulator directly into a superconductor. So you never need to think about Fermi surface instability. Uh, what we find is that in some very uh, generic way, the Fermi insulator first crosses over into a Bose insulator. The Bose insulator then has a superconductor insulator transition into a B like superconductor. So uh, in this simple system, you always have a Bose insulator to BEC transition. And then further on, you can cross over into a BEC as superconductor. So of course, I have to define what I mean by all these things. Uh, so I will in the rest of this talk. So as we will show, a Fermi insulator for us is one where the lowest energy excitation in the insulator is a charge E fermion. Okay? However, we say it crosses over into a Bose insulator because we'll find that in fact in a Bose insulator, the lowest energy excitation is a charge 2E object, which I loosely call a boson. So in fact, the energy gap for that is smaller than that for a charge E fermions. And in fact, this energy gap for the charge E2, the charge 2E object, goes soft at the transition. And then in a very well-defined sense, which again I will describe, so you go into a BEC regime and then into a BCS regime. And as I show, that given that this is a crossover, nevertheless, there is a, there is a somewhat sharp way in which you can uh, discuss what this crossover means. And I will discuss it in terms of the topology of the minimum gap locus, which changes both the to go from one to the other, and also the gap edge singularity in the same part of the Okay, so how did we arrive at these conclusions? The first we want to write down a simple 2D fermion model <coughs> which shows such a condition. So we want it to be translationally invariant from this order. Since we want a band insulator with at least in some limit, we need at least two sites or orbitals per unit cells, so we will get two bands in the insulator, conduction and valence band. We want superconductivity, so we'll also need attractive interactions. And we just put a local attraction uh, for two reasons. One is it will allow us to do quantum Monte Carlo with no sign problem. But also, actually, local interactions are easy to realize in four dynamic experiments. And the model that I'm going to propose can easily be uh, realized in four dynamic experiments with existing technology. Finally, since I don't want any other order parameters <coughs> here, just because I want uh, the simplest possible description. I'm going to work with a non-bipartite lattice, uh, which will suppress other order parameters <coughs> like charge density with it. So for instance, I could have thought of working on a checkerboard lattice on which there is a high potential and a low potential uh, in this way, and then put an attractive interaction. But here, in addition to a superconducting tendencies, the existence of this uh, Potential, but it also induce charge density waves, and that's not what something I want. So what we'll do is we'll work with a triangular lattice bilayer. The triangular lattice actually allows us to suppress the charge density wave order because there's no nesting and heat coupling, and it's a non-bipartite lattice. And the bilayer is what allows us to have two sites per unit cell and therefore gives us the two bands. So we will just work with the attractive covered model on a triangular lattice bile. Okay. So the Hamiltonian is very familiar to everyone. Uh, minus T is the hopping matrix element uh, on one of the planes of the triangular lattice near its neighbor. T curve is the hopping matrix <coughs> element across the bilayer. Negative U is the on-site attraction, and U is the chemical potential that controls uh, the film. I will primarily focus on zero temperatures. Let's maybe say a little bit about finite temperatures, and I will primarily focus on half filling, uh, which means one particle per site, so that I get a band insulator in the non-interactive loop. I can also discuss uh, what happens in the function of filling, and this will give us this equals one superconductor to make a transition uh, using the arguments of net. Okay, so now here I modified the picture from Asa's book. I have many routes to take, like diagrams, quantum Monte Carlo, and uh, being a good quantum mechanician and some over all these paths, okay? 
And there's a bear waiting for me. Fortunately, there's no sign problem, but you know, I'm meant to be in the Okay. So here's uh, the triangular lattice bilayer. There's uh, T over T perp, uh, which is just changing the band structure. Uh, U over T perp, which is increasing the attraction. And now, uh, at mean coupling, small u, I use diagrams and mean field, maybe. Uh, at little t equals 0, when there's no hopping in the planes, I use an atomic limit argument and the perturbation theory t. At very large u, uh, uh, I get into a strong coupling bosonic regime. And then in the middle, uh, where I have no other tools available to me, I look on the unformed model. Okay? Uh, without a sign problem. Good. So let's start with the non interacting limit. So in the non interacting limit, if I just look at this problem, then as a function of P over P per, there's a band insulator to metal transition. Because uh, if I take two bilayers and uh, I have no hopping within the layer, so basically what I get is I get two bands whose band bits are determined by T and whose separation is determined by T per. And so if T per is actually very, very large, the two bands get widely separated and I get a band insulator. And then when I cross some number like 0.22, uh, basically I find that the two bands merge and I get a metal. And of course, when I turn on a small u, I expect that this band will survive and I will get a fermion band insulator. And this metal will immediately undergo the usual BCS pairing uh, instability, and so I get a superconductor. So what I want to first study is how do I go from this fermion band instead of a superconductor, and so what I do is diagrams because I'm at deep up. And so all I need to calculate is the propagation of pairs, so I'm looking at zero momentum center of mass as a function of frequency, and I sum up ladder diagrams in the usual way, and here's what I learn. The first thing I learned is if I ask for the divergence of the static pairing chi, okay, then in the insulator, uh, the static pairing chi is finite, so I've got it 1 over pi, but as I change the band structure and make the gap collapse, the static chi diverges, uh, and that's the onset of the superconducting instability in the insulator. But I can do more than that, and I can look for a hole in this two particle propagator, and that's going to give me a gap to bear excitations in the insulator. So this defines the two particle gap as opposed to the obvious single particle gap in the insulator. And what I find is omega pair, which is the blue line, actually goes soft. So there's a finite energy to make a pair excitation in the insulator, but as I go towards the superconductor that goes soft, and in fact, in the superconductor, you know, this little bit of hair into the condensate of zero. Okay. So the surprising thing, was, in retrospect, not so surprising perhaps, is that <coughs> actually near the superconductor insulator transition, the energy cost to make a pair is lower than the energy to make a single particle excitation. Because a single particle excitation energy remains finite. This is just the band gap of this uh, band insulator as I'm changing uh, t. So it's much cheaper to make pairs inside the insulator as an excitation than it is to make a single particle. So it's like an <coughs> exoparticle energy. That's right, but it's a particle particle yeah. bounce state yeah. as opposed to a particle hole yeah. bounce state. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, now once it's so cheap to make pairs, then of course you start condensing them. Okay? And so how do you describe that? So the standard technique do that, mean field theory, so you write down a pairing uh, gap, delta. Uh, I, I call it a pairing gap because it's not always the spectral but energy gap, so we have to be a little bit careful about that. You solve the gap equations uh, uh, to find what delta does, and it does what it does as a function of q over t per at some fixed value of u. You can calculate the superfluid stiffness in standard phase, and this is the picture that you get. So let me just take you to these results. So if you look at the single particle energy gap, okay, it's finite. This is the band gap in the insulator, the black bottle. And then if you look at what the single particle energy gap is into the superconductor, 
It's just delta, the superconducting gap in the PCS regime. But if you look at what the energy gap is on the superconducting side of the superconducting insulated transition, from this mean field theory, you find that the two gaps, the bare band gap of the underlying insulator and the pairing gap because of superconductivity, they add in voltage. Okay? So, uh, what I'll show you uh, in the next few slides is that actually whether the energy gap, single particle energy gap in the superconductor is just determined by pairing or if it's determined by something else in addition to the pairing gap determines whether I'm in the BCS or the BBC regime if I make that precise. Okay. And the other point to note is that the superfluid stiffness is another energy scale that was soft upon approaching the superconductor insulated transition from the superconducting side. And you see that uh, deep in the BCS regime, of course, the superfluid stiffness is huge and the pairing gap is much smaller than that. However, near the superconductor insulated transition, in fact, the roles of these two are reversed. And so in, uh, the situation here is tailor made for a large amount of phase fluctuations. And the importance of phase fluctuations is not just limited to what I'm calling the BEC regime, where I have this uh, more complicated gap, but <coughs> even in part of what I'm calling the BCS regime, where the entire single particle gap is made up of pairing, I still have very large phase fluctuations. Okay, so now I want to discuss in an experiment how would you decide whether the underlying gap was entirely due to pairing or whether it had some other uh, component as well that was adding to it as it were. So to make that point, let me first discuss a simpler situation of a single band. Okay, and then I'll come back to the two band situation of interest to us. And here are the two concepts that I want to introduce. One is the uh, issue of the minimum gap locus, which is perhaps less familiar to a lot of people, but the gap at singularity is a rather obvious. So if I look at the standard definition of the Bogiova uh, quasi-particle energy and ask for what the single particle energy gap is, I, for the simple single band case, I immediately see that in the BCS regime or the weak pairing regime where the chemical potential lies inside the band, the gap is just delta. But when the chemical potential is negative in the BEC regime, then the gap has this quadrature of mod mu squared and delta squared. This is reminiscent of what I had in the previous slide, the counterpart of that in the single part. So um, let's see how this works out. The BCS case is very simple. <coughs> this is the working of dispersion. The minimum happens when epsilon A is equal to mu, and the gap is delta. So the, if you ask for what is the locus in momentum space where the energy gap for single particle excitations is a minimum, then that's a contour epsilon A equals mu in the weak coupling limit. It's just A is K as the underlying Fermi surface. Okay, and that's what you get. And as a result of the fact that the gap minimum actually exists on a contour, two dimensions, it's a contour, three dimensions, it's a surface, what you get is a one over square root singularity in these single particle density of states, which is extremely well known. But what happens in this BCS limit where the gap has this different form is a little bit different because now the minimum could have been out here. But actually, you are supposed to only look at the minimum of the working of quasi particle energy within the band. So, therefore, the actual minimum is shifted to a single point rather than a contour, k equals zero. And then the energy gap is not delta, but it's delta squared plus mu squared root. And the corresponding band, uh, uh, so, so corresponding singularity in the density of states is now no longer 1 over square root. It's just the standard van Hover singularity you have at the band edge. Two dimensions, it's, it's a jump discontinuity, and three dimensions is actually a square root rather than a square root. So this has very clear experimental implications. You could test this in photo emission as to what the minimum gap locus was, and you could test this in tunneling as to what the singularity of the band edge was to decide whether the underlying gap is just simply from pairing or there is this other piece to it as well. Okay? Uh, if you want to look at the connection between the so-called Luttinger surface related to the zeros of the zero energy Green's function of the BCS minimum gap locus, uh, you could look at this over here. 
Okay, so let me show you one slide of experiments from chlorine atoms. This is the analog of ARPES, Kerosol Arch Spectroscopy, done by the Regions Group at JILA. And although this is not a point that anyone is emphasizing that data or in that field, it's abundantly clear that you see the minimum gap locus. So when you're in a strongly interacting regime, uh, at unitarity as it's called, this is the BCS like dispersion. And the minimum gap happens at a finite value of momentum. But when they're in a molecular BEC regime, this is the dispersion, and the minimum <coughs> gap happens at A equals A. OK, now, back to the problem at hand, okay, which is the triangular lattice bilayer. And here, by calculating the dispersion of the excitation spectrum and uh, the single particle density states, we see that all the things that I was showing you in the simple one-band case also materialize here. That in the BCS regime, I get a confluent case space in the modulus square root singularity, whereas in the BEC regime, I get the minimum gap locus quantum shrinking to the point shape equals zero, and I get jump discontinuity in the single particle density states. Okay, so now if you look at the full phase diagram, just blindly putting faith in diagrams and mean field theory, you find that here is the phase diagram in the changing band structure changing interaction uh, plane. So in fact, from this perspective, there is two ways of undergoing the superconductivity transition. The one that I've been describing by just simply decreasing the underlying band gap and going from a Fermi insulator to a sliver or Bose insulator to TCS. But the other thing you could do is just keep the fixed band structure and just decrease attraction and go into a superconductor. That's it. But should I trust this phase diagram? And uh, I'm raising this question because, of course, the answer is no. This phase diagram is extremely misleading. In particular, uh, I'll show you that this phase transition never happens at all. And that's because the diagrams in the theory, which are perfectly fine, that small u give a qualitatively incorrect answers as you decrease u. And the way in which I'm going to convince you is by doing two calculations, <coughs> just for the fashion past you. One is in the atomic limited perturbation, and I see you never go into a superfluid. And secondly, I'm going to go into the strong coupling limit for bosons. I'm going to show you that there, too, you get a superfluid to insulator transition. Superfluid to insulator transition is just completely absent from this fermionic mean field. So first, let's look at the atomic limit. So the atomic limit actually is a diatomic limit. So if you switch off all hopping within the plane t equals 0, I get a two-side problem in a round. I can certainly solve that, okay? And at half filling, the ground state always has two particles, no matter what the interaction strength. But if you look at the first excited state, that changes qualitatively. At small attraction, of course, the uh, lowest energy excitation is a charge E for neon. However, at large U, the lowest energy excitation is a charge 2 E for neon from N equals 2 to N equals 0 to 4, okay? And then I can turn on topping, and whatever these excitations are, uh, they become mobile. But nevertheless, I go from a gap state to a gap state. So what this is telling me that I should go from a Fermi insulator to the Bose insulator, and not from a Fermi insulator to any kind of superconductor. This is a mean field. Okay. Next, what I'll do is I'll look at the very top of that phase diagram and see what's going on. And so now if I go to the very strong public limit, uh, then of course in very large U, I get hardcore bosons. That's just because of the underlying Pauli exclusion. Now it seems like the boson density is going to be one half per site because I have one per neon per site. So you might naively think that if you have a non-integer density of bosons, you're not going to get a mock phase in this, right? Because naively you would think you'd need an integer However, it turns out that you have one boson per rung, and that's enough to give you a mod phase in this particular problem. So the ground state for a single rung in the large U limit is, of course, one boson symmetrically placed in the two rungs. Okay? The first excited state uh, on that rung, with an excitation energy of T per square root of U, is uh, you put two bosons or none, or the anti-symmetric state. 
And if you look in the basis of these four states, I can uh, basically uh, ask, how do these kind of rung bosons hop from one rung to another? And obviously, the hopping parameter between rungs goes like t squared over u. So the energy gap, which is t perp squared over u, plays off against the hopping, which is t squared over u. <coughs> and when the two are comparable, you get a super way to mark transition uh, of all these rung bosons. And you can do a simple mean field estimate <laughs> that t over t perp is about 0 0.4 to give you a super way to mark transition. So what I've shown you is <coughs> that you generate interactions as well. You do generate interactions with the macula, and we've kept those into account with some artery fog level. And it uh, doesn't, and that, you've done that. Yes. Not with some SU2 symmetry, which makes it seem very This is a triangular level. And the filling is that, so that's very important. That's again the same physics that uh, we built in right yeah. from the beginning, which prevents that from happening. Okay, so what I've shown you is that you get a Fermi insulated and a Bose insulated crossover here, and a Bose insulated to BEC phase transition over there. So I've done all the three uh, sort of borders here, and now I have to fill up the middle uh, by doing variation, I'm uh, sorry, determinant on Monte Carlo, which is at least uh, numerically exact on finite scale classes. Five minutes. Okay, I can rush through the Monte Carlo. So the here I'm showing you uh, Monte Carlo results uh, done by uh, Richard Scaletta and Nandini Jivedi. Uh, so in the top, I'm showing you the pairing structure factor, showing that I'm going from a non-superconducting state to a superconducting state as I change T over T per. And I'm also computing the superfluid stiffness, and again showing the same thing that I'm going from a non-superconducting state to a superconducting state at this insulated transition, okay? And also here is the single particle density of states, which you can either use uh, analytic continuation, but if you don't like it, you can actually just look at the single particle means function directly in imaginary time and ask for how it decays, at least to get uh, this fact that you have a gap which remains some estimate. Okay. So even if you don't like the details of the density of states, you do can see, you can see clearly the existence Basically, what it's saying is that as you cross the superconductor to the transition, the single particle energy, uh, single particle density of states is always gap. It doesn't show any particular interest. Now, as in future work, one could do the quantum critical behavior. We haven't done scaling of the QMC data. We could also look at the pairing pseudo gap about TC uh, near the superconductor insulated transition, and indeed even transport near the superconductor insulated transition. And uh, previously, we have looked at both of these features uh, in quite some detail for the disorder-driven superconductor insulated transition. Uh, so we have all the tools to do that, but we just haven't uh, done it for this model. Um, good, so this is my conclusion, so let me end. So this is the phase diagram that we have for our simple model, showing that there are Fermi to Bose crossovers uh, in the insulator. There are BCS to BEC crossovers in the superconductor, and the transition actually happens always uh, from a Bose insulator uh, to a BEC, even though both of those regimes might be very, very small at very coupling. Uh, I didn't say much about what happens as a function of chemical potential. What I was telling you was actually <coughs> a path from this phase diagram, which goes to the set tip of the slope, always keeping the density. One, but actually uh, using the same arguments that we have, we have the one on the color of it, uh, filling, but using all the arguments to get the phase diagram to this quality and show here. And so this simple fermionic model has a phase diagram that looks rather like uh, the Bose uh, uh, superfluid to mock transition, even though, even in big coupling, you're very, very far uh, from any kind of bosonic picture as such. Uh, good, so I will leave uh, my summary which uh, uh, explains how we distinguish a Fermi insulator from a closed insulator and how we are proposing that in an experiment one can actually discriminate between a BBC or a B3S uh, in the superconductor. And 
happy birthday again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, we can discuss it. Yeah. Uh, let's take and wait again. 